The Centurions of Ultramar, an ultramarine successor chapter whose aesthetic is inspired by the Romans of ancient Earth. Their armor is of white, clouded marble. Their weapons pay homage to their ancestors. Gladius swords, hellbards, tridents, and spartan shields are wielded by these ultramarines who are obsessed with close combat warfare. Their years have been filled with triumph, their ranks riddled with glory. Their chapter master, Tramus in Candor, represents everything a centurion should be. Strong, fearless, unwavering and confident. In the eyes of his fellow chapter masters, he is the pinnacle of what their gene father would want them to be. The centurions of Ultramar have conquered and fallen, but each time they come back stronger. With each reset they are rebuilt, each time their might grows. From their ships they plummet, through the skies they roar, once on the battlefields nothing stands in their way. Other chapters fantasize over the glory they must be drowned in. Victory after victory comes their way, only because they earn it. Through flesh and blood, their fights are grueling. Wars do not scare them, but loss once did. Now Tramus has found that their failure only makes them stronger. Tramus in Candor was the first to introduce their favorite tactic of war, by challenging the leaders of their enemy's army. To single combat, he rewrote everything they loved about battle. When faced with warriors that proved pristine in the art of swordplay, Tramus and his elite issue their competition. Once the challenge has been called for, Ego takes control and their enemy cannot help but comply. When one is declared the victor, their armies stand down and their lands and properties handed to the victor. Of course, the centurions make sure they never lose. Through weeks of sleepless training in the art of dueling, they use those in their enemy's ranks that they have captured. Whoever wins the duel has their needs met with utmost respect. If the Astarte loses the duel, by yielding or by death, the Slayer is set free, only to be hunted down and captured again. Another training method for the Astartes in the ranks of infiltrators and their scouts. But what happens when their foe is dishonorable and betrays their word? It has happened a handful of times, and the massacre that comes has been told as a tale of horror by the whispering words of the galaxy. Fire scorched the dry grass in the field, their beckoning flames dancing around him, blackening his silhouette. Both armies that turned this world into a desolate rock lay dead. Ghosts of enemy and friend watched on. Alone he stood with death. Their conversation consisted of clashing swords and cries of pain. From half his body, Tramus bled. Both eyes were bloodshot and staring at the dead foe at his feet. The two were the last of their armies, and their duel became a fight for the survival of legacy. The war had been won. Mighty he was, but also alone. With his chapter dead, he thought on whether survival meant anything. Of course it did. By being destroyed by the warbands of chaos, they had become stronger. Through death he had learned. Stained marble, lined with gold trims, continued to breathe heavily. His helm protected his eyes from the roaring flames. All he could think of now was to rebuild. 
Tramus would now take the blades of his fallen to remind that failure comes to all no matter what, but also to allow the gift of hope to rebuild his warriors when they inevitably fall. Tramus in Candor traveled aimlessly, his boots extinguishing the flames engulfing the field. Loneliness gripped and held on tight, its clingy arms wrapping around him hoping to keep him forever, but Tramus did not care. Yes, the feeling was odd, but it wasn't tempting nor crippling. To him it was just there. The yellow light of the star rose. From the horizon, it crept, seeping over the edge of the world to grace his bloodied features. The dead were everywhere. Astartes, both corrupted and pure, had been massacred by one another, but not Tramus. His march continued until the light fell and darkness rose. Above him, galaxies' colours dressed the night with a vast array of alluring celestial faces. Navigating the dunes he had entered was simple. All Tramus had to do was walk. To him, it was a test, if he had the capacity to carry on until the Emperor blessed him with a reward for his repenting march, then he would continue to live. But if he succumbed to the depriving dunes, then he would welcome death with open arms. Clad in scarred ceramite, he pushed on. Day and night, Tramus battled with the strains of his failing warplate and the exhaustion of his own body. Aches plagued his joints, severed muscle chafed against scarred tissue causing his wounds to burn, and instead of suffering, Tramus endured. He stared at a world of sand. It greeted him with humidities that dried the very fabric of his soul, and now Tramus' body had betrayed him. It fought against the commands of his mind, struggling to obey. His movements were janky, even robotic. All the fluidity had been absorbed by the desert. From all the challenges Tramus was faced with, only one event from this day would stick with him forever. The vivid memory that would forever bless him was the sight of the purple haze floating over the miles of golden brown sand. The two colours clashed, creating a vision of beauty. One so powerful and divine that it made Tramus lose himself within its beautiful sight. He stopped walking. He didn't know he had, but he didn't mind it either. Stars caught his eye. Their sparkles danced across his iris, and he stayed. For hundreds of years he had fought. Not once had he stopped to appreciate life's gifts. Until now. Tramus in Candor was alone, but he was not lonely. He had an ocean of sand, billions of stars and nature's beauty to keep him company. Months of indoctrination reformed his chapter. Once again, the Centurions of Ultramar were mighty. Their power proved worthy and the Centurions waged war on the enemies of man like never before. Defeat greeted them time and time again, but Tramus fought like a god in ancient wars to keep it from consuming his chapter. Through self-sacrifice, he taught them that failure is nothing but a new beginning. A chance to become better. His defiant cries for war pierced their hearts like a great spear and injected them with the Emperor's golden light. Soon, he found that the Centurions had grown immune to its destructive effect.
strike me down. I dare you. Dramus taunted his enemy. Their armies were destroying one another while they conversed. Their war would end when the two had dueled and one stood over the other. His surroundings were all too familiar. A purple haze coated the night above the doomed sea, which ate the falling bodies. On a world far away from the sands that comforted him on his walk. On a night so similar to that same one decades ago, he faced his foe in a duel of honor. As swords clashed and his gladius tasted blood, Tramus could not help but focus on the battle around him. Bodies fell as his blade did. Each centurion that greeted the dirt burned a hole in his heart. Soon, his strikes began to miss. His form was off, his fluidity was drying up, and he suffered his enemy's sword. The Eldari were magnificent duelists. This craft world was one of expert blade work. Tramus understood the nature of his surroundings. Though the purple haze of that vivid memory was far from the planet he fought on tonight, its presence was here in a different form. It pushed calm waves throughout him, and Tramus realized that the surrounding battle had faded away. Only he and his opponent were here. A state that only warriors can understand came over him. A trance of combat wiped his memory clean. Tramer stepped forth. The Eldari was visibly annoyed at Tramus in Kandor, and Tramus knew it. Perfect, he thought. A breeze swept across the sands, carrying millions of grains with it. Each one sparkled as they flew into the duelists. His small, weak Eldari combatant was showing signs of fatigue. The sands were consuming the craft world's leader, extinguishing his internal fire under the endless dune air. Silence beat. The desert waited and watched as they faced off. Nothing came from them. Both were statues standing perfectly postured and staring at one another. It held its breath, and the dry air ceased. Tramus lunged. The purple haze illuminated the cloud of rising sand. The Eldari's guard was up to deflect, but instead was peeled away from his weapon. Tramus feinted his strike, and wrenched the Xenos sword free from its dried up hands. As he stumbled toward Tramus, his stomach met his knee. He was raised from the ground, only to have a giant hand placed firmly around his neck. Tramus tossed him to the sand and stepped over him. The alien outstretched his arm and pleaded for mercy, so Tramus complied. He kicked the Eldari's arm away, raised his gladius, and drove it straight through his heart. With his gladius in the Eldari's chest, Tramus was mere inches away from his face. The Xenos warrior used his final breath to whisper a horrible truth into his ear, one of betrayal and slaughter. Raising the corpse of the fallen warrior high into the air with one hand, Tramus revealed to all those across the battlefield that they had won. The Eldari had no choice but to forfeit their planet and run for the stars, and when some refused to turn and run, they were cut down by the centurions with no remorse. Their calls came to them all at once. Two other chapters of the Ultramarines were in need of their help. Deep within the galaxy's heart lay a planet that housed the Orc Menace. Their warg had grown so powerful that it had outmatched the two Astarte chapters, and a third was needed to help destroy the orcs. Of course, they heeded the call. How could they resist? 
They looked down upon the surface. The view of the planet shocked Tramus and his fleet. A world consumed by war waited for their saviors, desperately holding on for their arrival. And they came in storm. Thousands of craft broke the skies. Their appearance on the battlefield stunned their fellow chapters. They didn't deploy at the front line like they were instructed. Instead, they landed behind the orcs and carved their way to their brother chapters. And the meeting that took place would go down in history for the centurions of Ultramar. Their forward lines are nothing but guns. They outnumber us a hundred to one. The Star Alliance chapter master spoke with desperation. Tremus was deep in thought as they argued. A fortress? He thought of leveling it. High walls? His chapter could blow straight through them with ease. His hand moved from his sword's hilt to the hollow table that they stood around. Here. Where the fortress wall curved around its natural landscape was a mining tunnel which burrowed underneath. Its closed corridors will please me and my chapter. All you have to do is fire everything at that wall. Tramus left through the battered bunker wall. The two other chapter masters were agitated at his lack of contribution, but they couldn't deny that it was their only way through. Batteries hammered the wall. Artillery roared over their heads. While they charged towards the mining tunnel, blazing fire emanated from their gun barrels. The skies shook with the arrival of something big. Tramus did not care whether it was a Gargant or Gork and Mork themselves. He was too busy racing through dark corridors. Light was gone. Silence came over them, but they did not slow their pace. To the Orcs, the Space Marines were at the base of the wall trying desperately to climb it, so there was no need to pay them any mind. They would rather kill than think. Finally, they broke through the fortress. The mining tunnel had led them into a vast open courtyard. The walls wrapped around them. At their tops only green could be seen, the orcs were everywhere. Like lightning they moved, making it to the walls and scaling their staircases within moments. Green skin was torn open, their bodies flung from the tops of the wall to scream down to the ground. The first defense had been shattered. But still, the other two chapters could not assist them. The artillery covering the Centurions of Ultramar had been ordered to follow the other two chapters into a different opportunity. They were abandoning them. Tramus understood the facets of war, but couldn't believe it. They were leaving them to die. Orcs sprung into action. Rocket launchers and big shooters began laying waste to the fleeing artillery. Tramus made a choice. He ordered his men to cut them down, but by sacrificing his own blood, in order to protect the columns of tanks, he cemented his chapter's fate by writing it in stone himself. The fortress was swarmed. A hundred to one odds were now a thousand to one. The grey concrete of the fortress had been discoloured significantly by his chapter's blood. Three hundred of his men were dead, and there was no end in sight just yet. He looked around, hoping to find the war boss of the Orc clan. And there he was, a magnificent creature, covered in metal scraps and light blue paint. This was their path to victory. Tramus charged, many of his men followed, but only he made it to the war boss. After cutting down a thousand himself, the two locked blades. A power claw clasped around the blade of his gladius and shoved with all of its strength. Tramus pulled back. The beast caught itself before it could fall. Its grisly face darted around looking for him. After yanking the war boss back, he plunged his gladius down towards its head. 
Again, the power claw gripped the blade, halting its advance. Tramus could hear mechanical components crushing the sharp edges of his sword. The tighter it got, the deeper it pierced his sword's metals, so he pulled it free. Flinging himself backwards, he managed to dodge the claw's rampant strike and he dived onto the war boss. Throwing himself from his feet and into the air created a blow powerful enough that it could not be blocked. Finally, it met the orc's face. The war boss had been slain. But the orcs didn't care. Instead, they were excited over the fact that whoever killed their leader's murderer would become the next war boss. Thus began a fight for his life. The orcs had been smashed at the cost of hundreds of lives from the three chapters. Tramus in Candor was found by the other two chapter masters within the fortress, dressed in blood. The epitome of gore stood staring at them, rage within his eyes. Tramus considered killing the both of them, but what would be two more bodies to add to the pile? That was all they were to him since they abandoned his chapter. The conflict raging in his mind had to be put aside. Tramus was already falling to his anger when the dawn stones arrived. Their fresh fleet crowded the skies above, but when Drakana Garnus and his sandstone warriors greeted the three chapters with orders to salvage the armor of their dead, Tramus in Candor was the only one to object. How dare you! Watching the dawn stones tear the breastplates from his fallen angels shattered his heart. Drakan took a step toward him, his hand itching to draw his restored flail. The Tyranid invasion of the Black Arrow's homeworld had scarred his body, and because of it he was half machine. But Tramus was not scared. For all he cared, Drakan could be the Emperor himself, and he would still object to this disgusting display of betrayal. I have orders to take what is now mine. Your actions have forfeited your right to restore these relics, so they have been passed on to me. Drakan was smug about it. He found pleasure in crippling the Ultramarine's will. You have no right, Drakan. Tramus screamed. I have every right. I have orders. Then your orders are wrong, and you are blind to follow them. Does your mind not think for itself? Do you not care at all? Tramus still had his gladius in his hand. He swung it while he talked, which made Drakan nervous. I do think for myself. Why do you think I'm here? Your brothers have complied with my orders, so why don't you? Drakan kept a close eye on Tramus' sword, making sure it didn't get too close. And because this is not right, what would your gene father think? Tramus hoped the insult would stab deeper than his gladius, so that he didn't have to use it. He would hate all of us, like he does all of his sons. Drakan spoke a cold truth, and he didn't care what Tramus thought of it. Tramus had his entire chapter waiting for his sword to swing. The second it would be let loose, they would fight alongside him, regardless of any and all consequence. Take their armor, and I take your life. Dramus entered his warrior's trance. All he could see was Drakan raise his weapon, but a split second later, everything around him slipped into a deep, red, Haze. Tramus swung for Drakan. His gladius carved a deep wound in his stomach which forced him back. Bolters were fired from all sides. The star lions and the angels of light were in disbelief at what they were seeing. The centurions of Ultramar ravaged the Dawnstones, killing over a hundred Astartes within minutes. Tramus looked down at Drakan who was holding his bleeding stomach. 
He pointed his gladius at him. A bolt around slammed into Tremus's shoulder pad, and he recoiled from the force and slowly walked backward toward the gunship that had just arrived. He stepped in and looked back at Drakan, who had now stood. Blood gushed from his gut, which brought a smile to cover his face. Tremus and his Astartes fled. Wounded and with over half their chapter dead, they turned their backs on the Imperium of Man. Their vow to fight for humanity still stuck with them, but the Imperium were now their enemies.